Right, welcome to uh, Green and Purple. Uh, this is basically going to be a bit of the improv into, I'm going to use a bit of the old sampler, the very same sampler I used to use with Phil. I'm going to play the old um, Sam Lee, Les Paul, and the one of my old fuzz bucks. That's all I'm going to use today to kind of conjure up some of the uh, spirit of the old uh, tune. So I'm going to start by just playing, so I've set this at a kind of open loop, which is... Um, to get the loop in sort of bass line happening on it. Um, obviously sometimes you play the bass, electric bass, and then start swap the guitar. I'm gonna do the whole thing just to show learning up on a basic guitar today. Um, so we're gonna put some sounds into this, see what can uh, conjure up. <laughs> Thank you. 
that's um, a kind of version doing some improvisation. It took a bit of time to sort of level because I've not really gone through that yet. But um, <clears throat> basically, the whole first bit of the piece that the loop is, in fact, in the dots, Phil's wrote out many years ago for uh, Japanese uh, uh, guitarist magazine, uh, the basic outline. This is the main theme from Green Purple. There's obviously the big slow rubato section after it as well. Um, today I was just looking at how to make the main parts work and he just mentioned there about when we did it as a duo. In fact when I first started doing it as a duo with Phil I just played it on um, just my last time when Phil played it on his uh, strap so I split the parts up like that and I didn't initially start it with doing the loop but later found live with my old two second loop which I saw this old Digitech um, I could get pretty much the kind of basic riff and tempo down so Basically, I listened to some of the bass lines that uh, I, I obviously have played it with the band within cahoots and before me was Hugh and the recorded album uh, <clears throat> on Cutting ba Both Ways. So there's lots of variants on that basic bass line um, that, that, that Phil wrote down. The one that I use, if I turn up, shall we? The bass. <laughs> the basic kind of groove now the whole of this kind of first section is built on the magic symmetric scale I used to call it a double diminished scale um, and people call it all kinds of things uh, into messian limited one mode one of limited transposition in the mid called it the octatonic scale so I've seen it been used and looked at derived in very <coughs> many different ways uh, basically, the whole scale it's born on this one is actually the upside down version. A lot of the times people learn it the other way around to start with, um, which gives you a whole different set of harmony and chords. So this way, it starts what we call the half oh, which works on lots of uh, poly chords, which I'll talk about in a little while. Basically, the whole make up the scale, so it starts from E, the magic E, and then F sharp, G. in there which form all these wonderful kind of what I call inside or outside in harmonies um, and people wonder how some of the players have listened to in the past obviously like going back to Phil's music is quite a feature of it in different ways uh, in sort of bebop music and in sort of regular kind of standards it's used as a kind of more like a passive scale rather than it being a kind of entity on its own so from out of that scale it generates all these sounds obviously we're using the bass line which is built out of that um but the, the whole scale for play octave higher you can hear lots of different sounds so i'll try it from e flat there <laughs> Which gives you a lot of the ideas where some of that's coming from the kind of blues influence, you know, but use it in a kind of a different harmonic context. So the chords that are formed out of this, depending on the way you look at it, and if you take that as the root note, the, the E on this scale, it gives you all these notes. Sorry. <coughs> so it gives you, I'll do that again because it's. Uh, so I took it from the. See the scale written in a book a lot of times was written down as half then you move to and kept moving up and either moving up with the fourth finger or moving backwards downwards with the first finger you know coming back so you get this okay it kind of works and you can obviously do whatever finger you want, but I tried to get the things in unit so I could finger it and then move it into units. <coughs> with the least kind of movement, so I could get a lot more intervallic work out of the scale as well, so I can actually play, for instance, Uh, scale 
houses built with lots of, um, we've got all devil's intervals here, tritones if you look at So it gives you all these kind of really unusual kind of uh, what's considered like out sounds by some people, but uh, kind of like these ones because you can bend them into all sorts of places and do a lot of stuff with it. Now, for, for chords out of that, um, the whole of the green pill is built around a, a kind of essentially around a, a, a ostinato or loop, if you want to call it that, um, which is the first chord is, is like against an E. It's more like an E flat over an E. It sounds weird, you know, or D flat over E, so it gives you that kind of tension. Uh, and then you've got this other chord, which is uh, underneath, or you can have. is built on these two chord essentially if you like uh, partials or triads and the so it's between those two kind of uh, links and that's what the whole link of the passage is linked around now obviously you can do extra stuff with it um, and put other additions to it so you can now add extra sort of big spread chords um, of course one of the, the, the classics there obviously is that which is like some people call it a, a D sharp try over an E or E flat over E and uh, which obviously if you listen to a lot of great composers have done that and it's part of Phil's writing and incorporating between a kind of a more sort of heavy sort of real sort of rock groove with that kind of um, symmetry going on there. So it gives you lots of harmonic, you know, lots of possibilities chord wise. What it is, is when it's this scales in the other inversion, it's giving you all the other, it's, a, it's like, I think of it sometimes like an upside down scale. You imagine you turn upside down, you hear the music upside down, it's great. Um, so you get chords like this. So it's like, if you, which is, I mean, one way of looking at it, some people can say it's just in, a, in it's an inversion of A, <laughs> seven. Yeah. In fact, you can use lots of blue notes and sort of blue, blue, blues phrases throughout it, but in a different uh, inversion, which is great. of what I call angling. I mean, I remember composing a paper called it uh, angularity because it had all these different angles and pinnacles in it. So um, yeah, that gives us the the kind of root, the general root movement of it, but you get all these fantastic harmonies because it's kind of symmetric. Every minor third, I can get something different, which is great for building sort of tension in the music, you know. In fact, this piece used to be called in cahoots, I think we used to call it, or Pep used to call it, the crowd scarer. So it was uh, either crowd scare or crowd pleaser, depending on you. Where the so you hear those ideas cropping up in Phil's compositions, actually, even moving through much later on in a different kind of context. But the whole of Green Pilk has got these kind of things different colors if you like looking at it in kind of different ways you know combinations so yeah harmony wise you've got all that the the e flat over the that and then it's like an a7 really with a flat nine with an e bass so that's like some people call that an a sharp 11 7 sharp going to a an a7 Lots of interesting things you can add to this for different colour and stuff and the sound, which are all generated from that scale. So, yes, the melody, uh, the way it fits over that particular groove that I put down <coughs> is all pretty much a fast kind of sixteenth passes, um, and it's basically so it's a little melodic extract. Is you starting on there? I think this is one Phil played it round. So you get the 
So that whole first scale, same with the phrase. You know. <laughs> Descending uh, line down the scale, so you come out of the. <laughs> or you can bend. So you can give it a lot more uh, vibrato, a lot more shake on that kind of top note. Uh, so the whole melody is just that uh, scalic idea moving. Down, you've got the intervals, and then you've got the scaly card here moving down. The second half of it, same again, and then. So the last part of it is a bit tricky to get the last little phrase. But the basic thing is that the melody is moving down that scale. So they're the basic two ways, and it's all in the, um, luckily, the tab and the music we've got there. Another thing we used to do with this is to harmonise it. So, for instance, because it's in uh, symmetric, if I started that part, which you can do with two guitars, so you get... If I played it just a semitone down, which is like three frets, the same shape. I mean, I could show you how to do it. Yeah. So, so that really gives you like the harmony, if you see it. If you put a harmonizer on, that's another way, using the pitch shift to do the effects with a diminished scale. If you set it to a minor third, it's a good creative way of using that as well. Do it up as like a desk cam. As a <laughs> so you get this crazy part building up over the top of it. Um, I don't know, I'd like to show you a little bit of how that harmonised actually. So that which gives you a giant, if you like, diminished kind of chord. Um, so there's lots of possibilities if you're playing with more people with this to give people just a, a part, like a minor third away, which gives a crazy harmonic effect. Um, I'm just thinking there's any more things I can say on this. So, so the last section, which would get you to the point of where the second part of the piece comes in with a big rubato to, to lead out of that, um, that comes after you've played the phrase again. the main three elements with that and of course you can use this to improvise round one thing I know Phil used to encourage with the guys is at the opening you can experiment with sounds sonics it was very much an open improvisation but leading into the, eventually into that big groove what we used to bring with the drums which I used to start doing on the guitar um, which set up I try to set up the loop which can be difficult depending on the acoustics and situations one of the things with using Mine's quite old primitive gear compared to what a lot of people got now, but um, was to get the levels right with the amplifier so I could monitor it, so I could really hear playing on top of the groove, so I didn't lose it if I started playing too with too much overdrive on it, for instance. You know, it's very easy for what I call acoustic cancellation, which is like one sound cancels out another. So um, that's some th things to be aware of and be careful of. 
when setting loops up. So always try and make sure when you set the amplifier or you're playing through monitors that you've got enough monitoring level to play over it. And that was always the tricky thing, I think, in looping in any situation. So you could hear what you want to play with and uh, play against. It's a bit like getting two clocks in a room and if one gets out of sync, you know, and the other one's not hearing what they're doing, you'll hear this uh, kind of out of sync kind of system going on. So uh, that, that's my kind of tips with um, delay stuff is watching the, you know, watching the sound there as much as anything, but it's very easy to get carried away with sometimes when you're playing or really performing music live in the moment of doing it. Um, so they always crave a little bit more or something. So it's good to leave a little bit of headroom with the backing part, which I've got plenty of today. And in fact, I probably didn't have enough with the lead sound. So it's always something to spend a bit more time with. So uh, anyway, it's the first one of that now. I hope that gives you a bit of a, an insight into it. And uh, we'll look at it in more detail at some other point. All right, so I'm gonna set this up with a, the old Digitech sampler. It's set to about, um, Sometimes I've got a slow two second one, but I've got it a little bit up from there, probably about a second and a half, roughly. Depends how you feel on the day with this, how it's going to go. So sometimes with adrenaline, you can feel like playing it more up on stage or down as it goes. 